Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me for Polishing Your Manuscript, Manuscript Preparation from the Perspective of an Editor. My name is Josiah Davis, and I would like to thank Audrey and the Wright Services for allowing me to host this class here for you today. I'll be presenting this course in three parts, three different sections that I believe will be useful to you, both as an author and giving you some insight as to the, uh, the professional industry side of things. I would just like to take a minute to introduce myself here. My name is Josiah Davis. I started editing about three years ago now when a friend of mine who's an author asked me to take a look at a manuscript that he'd written. He had sent the manuscript off to a editor, small press uh, that he knew, and got the book back. And there were only about 15 or 20 corrections throughout the entirety of the book. Now, he knew that I was an avid reader and was also really critical whenever I read anything, so he sent the book to me just to see if I could catch anything else that the editor might have missed. I was able to get the book back to him with about four to 500 corrections in it, and from then on, he just decided that after the editor of the small press edited a book for him, he would then send it off to me to make sure that there was nothing that they had missed. He started uh, recommending me and referring me to other authors that he knew, and I ended up loving it and made it a full-time business. Since then, since that point three years ago, I've worked with over 70 authors and have done over 50 published novels. So that background on myself done, we can uh, start in here on the actual meat of the course. Now, when I go through a book, when I'm editing a novel, the first thing I always start with is the plot. The, the writing is something that I focus on after the plot, but the plot if you have major issues in your book, they need to be taken care of before you get into the nitty gritty of the writing. Now, the first thing I look for in the plot is, is everything believable? And let me, let me give you some examples here of that. There's a book that I did about three years ago, right when I was getting started, and the author had his main character meet a dragon and the dragon grows up alongside of him. And he mentions at one part that the dragon is 20 meters across the shoulders and wings, and then almost reaching up to the main character's height at the nose. Now, if you think about that, that means that this dragon is about 66 feet across and about five feet tall. That was, that's just, a, just an example of something in the plot that a lot of people are just gonna skim by, but the second someone looks at that and realizes the issue, they're just gonna kinda lose belief, lose credibility in the author completely. Uh, another example that, um, that I had in a book, this one was about two years ago. They have the main character who's a 15-year-old teenage girl. She comes across what the author describes as a thick metal door. The woman tries to get inside the door to no avail and ends up just gritting her teeth and kicking the door as hard as she could and ends up splintering the door and is able to get through. Now, again, that's the sort of thing that most people might just gloss on by, but if you take a minute to think about it, you realize, well, that main character should have just shattered her knee there, and that's that. Um, another thing that I see frequently that authors, authors mess up, and I blame action movies on this problem, is uh, shooting a gun without ear protection. Now, in certain situations, if, you're, if you don't want to slow the scene down, I can understand why you're going to have a character shoot a 9mm gun without any ear protection. But if you're making a specific mention that they're using a 50 cal rifle, which was the case in one of the books that I did recently, about three to four months ago, and you don't make a single mention on ear protection for the shooter, and you don't mention anything about the deafness or ringing in his ears for the next three weeks that he endures after that, then the reader is going to lose faith in you. And got uh, one more example here on something that just wasn't believable in a, in a book that I did. Um, it was a Western. The main character was a man who's about 5'6", fairly slight of build, and he's injured at this point. He comes across a rail car, sees a crate of coal there, grabs the crate of coal, drags it outside, empties it out, drags the crate of coal back to the train car, and, and hops inside of it. Now, my policy is don't trust the author for various things like that. And so I just looked up, how much does a crate of coal weigh? And it turns out that if a crate of coal is about four feet across by four feet across, and only half full of anthracite coal, that's still 2,400 pounds. Now, again, that's the sort of thing, is it picky? Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Is that important though? Most assuredly. That's something that you need to make sure that you have consistent, you have believable at all points in your book. If you say anything, you need to make sure, unless you're bending reality for a specific reason, 
you need to make sure it's believable. Let's move on to the next slide here. All right, so are there inconsistencies in your book? And that would just be a matter of, uh, there's a book that I did about two and a half years ago where you had the main character meeting a couple, main character um, encounters the couple, they had never met each other before, and then about three pages later, the, uh, the woman of the couple addresses the main character by his name, whereas the author had never had him introduce himself by name. They just encountered each other, but they didn't actually say a name to the person. So those sort of little things are just things that will create some cognitive dissonance within your reader. It's something that the reader, most of them might not notice, but the ones that do, those are the ones that are gonna leave negative reviews for you on Amazon, and that's it's a big no-no. Another example of this, there's a, a sci-fi book that I actually just finished up last week, and it talked about some uh, space travel and jumping around and uh, doing a, a deep space expedition. And the author said that five years had gone by, talked about some events happening. Then says three, year, three more years had gone by. And then in the next paragraph, without establishing any more progress of time, said that it had been over 20 years since they had left. And then about a page later, he said, oh, it had been nearly 30 years now. And that's just the sort of thing that if you're not filling in not filling in those time frames for your reader, again, cognitive dissonance, that's just gonna bother them. So moving on from, uh, from the plot, those are the, some of the big issues that I look at. Moving on from the plot, we have the writing. Are there repeated words? Now this is something that nearly every author that I've worked with absolutely hates when I make the comment, just use this word, find a synonym. But it's also, they've said, one of the most beneficial things. Now for me, I am a real stickler on repeated words. If you've used a word and it's not a common word such as the, of, and, but, or, or things on that nature, then you really shouldn't use it in the same paragraph. And honestly, you shouldn't use it for a couple paragraphs after that. The reader will notice if you're using the same words over and over again, and it'll really bother them and remind them that they're reading as opposed to experiencing your book. Now, extrapolating further from there, if you have some, some massive word that you want to employ in your book, if you, there's some favorite big SAT word you remember and you want to put that in your book, and it's something that the average person doesn't know and will have to look up, you get two uses of that in your book. That's it. If you do any more than that, then the reader's going to know that you just did that to sound fancy and, and intelligent rather than doing it for a specific purpose. Now another one here is, are the pronouns clear? Uh, this, this is actually a line from a book I finished about two weeks ago. The crew met up with the natives, they led them through the forests. Now, sure, you can infer what's meant there, but at the same time, that is a major issue in writing. You need to make sure that your pronouns are, are always clear. This is something I see the author, authors mess up fairly frequently. You may know what, uh, which pronouns you meant there, which uh, people you're referring to, and the reader could probably figure it out if they took a moment to, to look deeper into it, but do you really want them to be pulled out of the story just to figure out what your pronouns are trying to mean? That's, again, just the sort of thing that reminds the reader that they're reading rather than experiencing your book, and you definitely don't want that. Um, now, here's, here's one of my favorites. Uh, within the writing, are there errors in the word choices? As in, are they using the wrong words? Uh, some these are some of the main examples I see there. Just horde, as in a army of army of individuals versus horde being a dragon's treasure trove. Peak, peak, and peak. The peak of a mountain. You peaked around the corner, or your interest has been peaked. Red versus read versus red. That's a fairly common one. Lead versus lead or lead, depending on the, the conjugation of it. Farther and further, that's a, uh, that's a main one that a lot of people don't understand the rule of, and I'll just give you a quick clarification with that. Farther is any distance that you can physically measure. So if there is any sort of physical measurement to it, if you talk about, I've never thrown the ball any farther than that, um, he was 10 feet farther down the street. So if there's any sort of physical measurement, then you'd use farther. Further refers to conceptual distances. If you say that, um, emotionally you've grown further apart. If you, if you talk about anything that's a concept rather than a physical distance, then you'd use further as opposed to farther. Into and onto is another one that people mistake frequently. 
affect and effect, accept and accept. Those are, those are all ones. And those are things that you can do on your own, even before you send your manuscript off to your editor. You can do a search in your book for pretty much every single one of these, and it's likely you've used, you've used pretty much all of them, except probably the first one if you're not writing in any sort of any sort of high fantasy setting. But you can do a search through these and just make sure they're all correct. Just as you do a search through your book for all uses of your as in possessive or your you are or their as in the distance over there, their possessive or their contraction, you can do a search through those as well. Polish up your manuscript just to make sure that uh, you've finished the, the simple errors before you send it off to your editor. All right. So that finishes the uh, first part of this, this talk here. And uh, the section I want to get into now here is things you should look for when you are searching for an editor. Now, finding the right editor can be a really difficult balance. Um, you want to find someone who has a good turnaround time. You want to find someone who you personally gel with. You want to find someone that you can afford too. whether someone, someone may have the most impressive resume and, uh, and personality in the world, but if they're charging a lot, more than you can afford, then that's just not going to work out. So you're going to, you're going to want to just take some time and find the right editor. You may, may see someone that you think is the right person, but send out, send out multiple samples towards uh, multiple people. Make sure that the one you're working with is someone that you'd like to stick with. Um, I've noticed a lot with my, with my own clients that the more we work together, the better both of us get at uh, just each other's work. Um, I'll notice uh, specific issues that authors are making more and then start to start to make comments towards those and they'll know the specific things that I'm looking for and will try to polish up their manuscript to make sure that I don't catch anything of those natures. So when you're looking for an editor, I would say step one, the bare minimum, you got to make sure they have a website. Now, the reason for that being if an editor isn't willing to put in the, the time, money and efforts towards towards refining their own business and having a website, why should you trust them with your time, money, and effort? If they're not putting in their best, or they're not putting their best foot forward and having just a good website, then I honestly wouldn't trust the work they have to offer because they obviously don't take their business as seriously as you're going to take your manuscript. Another one here is, are they personable and easy to reach? Again, Someone might have the best portfolio in the world, a fantastic set of, uh, set of testimonials and good turnaround time, good prices, but if you try to contact them and they're difficult to deal with, then I would stay clear. Certain personalities are going, to, are going to react poorly to other different types of personalities, so it may not be that this editor is, is a, a difficult person, could just be a difference in personality types. That's another, another definite factor as well but you just want to make sure that this editor is someone that you'd enjoy working with. Because again, ideally it's going to be an ongoing process where you work with them for your next, however many books you want to do. Um, and also being, being easy to reach is a, uh, an important thing as well. You just want to make sure that you don't have to jump through hoops in order to get a hold of them. And that again, you enjoy talking with them and working with them. This one's similar here to the last one, but I, I thought it did merit a separate slide. Do they respond in a timely fashion? Personally, my, my stance is that I respond to every email within 24 hours of receiving it, unless I'm out of town without signal for whatever reason. Um, I don't think you need someone that, that responds that quickly, but I think you should have someone that obviously is putting in an effort to respond to all of your inquiries. You send off a uh, inquiry to an editor and they keep you waiting for, for one or two weeks before you get a response, then either they're too busy to take on any projects at all, or they just don't take you, your work, and your time seriously enough. If it takes you a week to get a response from someone, then what sort of, what sort of trend is that setting when you're on a deadline for your manuscript? So I think this is just another, another major thing just to, to keep in mind when you are working on your search for an editor. And now this, this one is real important to me because I see a lot of people out there who are getting started as editors. They say that uh, they've had some friends tell them they were good at editing. They say that they enjoy the editing process or they have a, a bachelor or master in English or editing. And so they call themselves a professional editor. And what's the first thing they do? They go to the, 
American Freelancers Guild of, uh, of, of writers and editors, and they look to see the prices there. And they see, oh, all right, apparently I should be paid four to $6,000 per manuscript, and that's what they charge. Now, unless this person has 10 to 15 years experience and is literally a member of the union, then they have no grounds to charge what they do. Um, there are different, different pricings for different markets and that sort of thing. But the big thing to look for is, do their testimonials and portfolio back up the prices they're charging? Is the person attempting to charge union rates and they're still at an entry level amount of experience? If this person has uh, barely worked on any projects then they should be working for near free just because they need to take that time to build up their, uh, their resume and expertise. So now that we've finished the first two parts of my talk here, we'll be able to delve into the section that I think will, will benefit all of you the most. This is how to get your manuscript ready for editing. It's kind of ironic because I had recently finished an article series written for Hydra Publications. They're a, a small press based out of Lexington, Louisville, Kentucky area. Um, I've edited, I think, five books for them now. And uh, their, their owner, Tony Acri, had com contacted me asking me if I would write an article series for their blog just on how to get your manuscript ready for editing, just a perspective from an editor on how authors can best prepare the manuscript to make both of our jobs easier. Now, if you were to look at that, you might think, well, isn't that what I'm paying my editor to do? Isn't that what, what their sole job is? And yes, but at the same time, do you want to know that the editor you're paying is using their time and effort and energy and mental focus on catching mistakes that you could easily weed out on your own? Or do you want to know that they're going in and really fine tuning it because you hand them a very, very polished draft? I've, I've worked on both ends of the spectrum. I've worked on books where I wind up fixing a bunch of little silly mistakes that the author missed, and I'm not really able to get into the fine tuning and polishing and really, really perfecting the book because I'm spending most of my time fixing mistakes that they could have easily caught on their own. But at the same time, I have had books where the author has clearly spent four or five drafts on their own, or maybe even more, polishing their manuscript up, and then the work that we're able to produce together has been really, really good. So. I'm going to uh, just address the different articles that I wrote for the article series. It was made in five parts, and I'll just go through each one individually, and hopefully they'll be, they'll be beneficial to you and also beneficial to your editor. Okay, so the first one, and this is one that I harp on probably more than anything else, is consistency. Now, this is something that a lot of readers might not notice, but you will get readers that do, and again, those are the ones that are you want to make negative comments on your Amazon page, which you definitely don't want. Consistency can come down to a number of different things. Uh, I have here on the page just a couple quick examples. Things like the word okay. Those are the two accepted ways to write it in your book. Um, same with the uh, you know, US if you're talking about the United States. You need to make sure that whatever you choose, you stick with that all the way through your manuscript. I, I can't tell you the number of times that I see authors put okay, both in lowercase, then okay, one uppercase, one lowercase, then okay, both uppercase, then okay, spelled the word out, first letter uppercase, then okay, spelled the word out, all of it lowercase, and that sort of thing is going to drive your readers nuts. Now, it may sound like a tedious fix, but it's actually pretty easy. You're just going to go through your manuscript and, and search for all the possible different iterations of whether it's okay, whether it's U.S. versus U period S period, or specific terms to your book. If you're, say, you're writing a fantasy book and you have a character referred to as the Shadow King, which was the case in a book I edited recently, um, the author made the decision to even capitalize the article there, the, and so he had the Shadow King, all three first letters capitalized, and that was his specific choice and term in his book. And he made sure that he just did a search through his manuscript for all uses of that and made sure everything was consistent because he knew that I'd harp on him if he didn't. So that's something that you can easily do on your own. Any specific term that you're having in your novel, whatever they may be, you can do a search through your book and make sure that every, every single iteration is consistent with it. Um, like I said, same for uses of okay, US, and other, other words where there could be a personal variation to it. Second one here is uh, punctuation. Now, 
I say punctuation and you probably think, well, I'm a writer. I know how to punctuate things. Yes, but, but do you? Now, this is something that people just take for granted in punctuation and they'll, they'll mess up fairly frequently. The, uh, the first one here would be, if you have a set of quotes, a period or comma always goes inside of the quotes, even if you're quoting someone and the period or comma wasn't a part of what they were saying. Now, this is, again, something that you can easily do a search through your document. Just do a search for your, uh, your quotation marks and a period or comma on the outside. Change every single use of those to the period or comma on the inside. Only variation you could have with this is, um, is if you wind up with um, exclamation points and question marks, those would go on the outside if the exclamation point or question mark is not a part of the part of the question or exclamatory statement in question. Um, another, another thing with the punctuation would be if ever you have single quotes and double quotes ending a sentence, you want to make sure just for formatting purposes, and you'll see it in pretty much all of the big five edited manuscripts, that you have a period, then your single quote ending the single quotes, then a space, and then your double quotes. This is something I only learned about about six months ago or so, because I just hadn't encountered it before. But that's another thing that you can do in your manuscripts. Make sure you do a search through for your, if you have any uses of uh, period, single quote, double quote, and just get a space in there. Just another way to clean up your manuscript before you send it off to your editor. Um, ellipses, those are another one. Ellipses, unless you have a very specific usage of the four dot ellipsis, which generally you're not gonna come across. I think I've, I think I've only edited one book that had the four dot ellipsis. In general, ellipses are always three periods. Unless, like I said, it's a specific choice to use the four. Meaning, another way to search that up is just do a search for two periods next to each other and make sure that it's either the ellipsis or maybe you had an extra period in front of a, a end of a sentence. And then also do a search for four, five, six. I've seen seven not ellipsis before. And make sure that you cut those all down to three. It doesn't matter how much you're having your character trail off their train of thought, having more ellipsis is just a mistake. It's, it's not used for emphasis. Another one you can do is in general, before the words but or yet or however, things like that, you're gonna have a comma before them. Most of the time, you're, if you have a comma before every use of but, that's going to be right more often than not. And then your editor can go through and, uh, and cut the ones that aren't needed. Or you can look up the specific rule for that. But like I said, in general, you should look up the word but and just do a control F through your document. Make sure you have a comma before every use of but where you might need it. All right, now we're on to adjectives. This one's fun. Now, if you were to talk to the average native English speaker in America, they're not gonna know that there is a specific order of adjectives they have to use and that they do use on a daily basis without realizing it. If you were to speak to someone who, who is a non-native English speaker, who learned English and then moved here, they're going to know generally the specific order of adjectives needed in English. This is something that people use just inherently. They, they know because it sounds correct, but they don't actually understand what the rule is or what the order of adjectives has to be. In English, the order of adjectives has to be, as you see there on the screen, opinion, size, age, shape, color, origin, material, purpose, and then your noun. So as you see in the examples beneath, if you were to say you have a lovely, little, old, rectangular, green, French, silver, whittling knife, then people know exactly what you're talking about. But if you change that order even a little bit, you're gonna wind up with a silver, rectangular, lovely, old, French, whittling, green knife, and people aren't gonna have a, a single clue what you're trying to say there. They're gonna think you're crazy and wonder why you're even allowed to write a book in the first place. So adjective order is very important. Just something to pay, pay close attention to when you're writing. And moving on from here, we have dialogue tags. This is another one that's really simple to fix on your own, but it's something that a lot of authors mess up when they send off a draft to an editor. With your dialogue tag, if you have your dialogue tag connected to your sentence, as in, what are you doing over there, he said, then you're going to need to have lowercase with the dialogue tag. If I, if I say, don't touch that, comma, quotation mark, she said, then you're going to need to use a comma there and lowercase with the dialogue tag because it's a part of the same sentence. 
So this is again something that it's going to be tedious, but you can do a search through your document. Just do a control F for all uses of either he said, or if you want to look up your period quotation mark or comma quotation mark, just to make sure that all your uses of dialogue tags are correct. If it's a part of the same sentence, part of the same idea, then it needs to be lowercase. That also extends if you're talking about question marks and exclamation points. Uh, like the first example I said there, mistakenly, if I, were to, if I were to say, what are you doing over there, he said, he would need to be lowercase because that's a part of the same sentence of the dialogue. That, uh, that's not something that can stand on its own, so it would be lowercase because the thought continues. Same with exclamation points that follows the exact same rule there. Now, another one that, that can be tough and writers start using when they get more advanced with it is a dialogue tag as interruption. Um, and so that would be if you're saying something in dialogue and then you have a, a comma, quotation mark, and then a dialogue tag, which is either an action that's currently occurring in the scene or some sort of interruption, but then the dialogue line continues. If it's in the same breath, in the same sentence, then you're gonna use a comma quotation mark and then uh, lowercase when you begin up the dialogue again. And the final one here, and this is one that uh, that's very, very easy search and fix. If you were to just search through your document for all uses of he said, she said, all your, all your different dialogue tags, if there's a dialogue tag and then a present participle verb, which is gonna be a verb ending in an ing ending, then you're going to need a comma in between them always. Um, if you were to say, I don't think you should do that, he said, standing at attention, then you need a comma between that every single time. If you have a dialogue tag, then present participle verb after it, you need that comma to separate the two. All right, now moving on, we have the, uh, the final part here, part five, which is capitalization. Now, Again, this is something that people may, may think they know or take for granted, but it's a very easy mistake that I see authors making fairly frequently. If you have a noun that can be used in place of a name, then you capitalize it. That would, uh, that would refer to things like mom and dad. If you were to say, um, what are you doing there, mom? That use would need to be capitalized because you're using mom in place of, place of the name. It would be a common noun rather than a proper noun if you were to say, my mom doesn't think you should do that. You're referring to, the, the, to mom there as a common noun, as an object, and so you wouldn't capitalize it. Now that same thing translates to if you're writing any sort of a military book, if you're writing any sort of high fantasy, science fiction, those sort of things, when you have military titles. If you were to say, the general doesn't think you should do that, you wouldn't capitalize that because you're referring to the general as a common noun. Now, that does vary if you're using general as a specific capitalized term, but then we'd go back to the consistency issue that we talked about in the, uh, the first page of this. But in general, if you're just talking about military titles and, and that sort of thing, you wouldn't capitalize it. However, if you're using general in place of the name, what do you think, general? That use would be capitalized because you're going to have it being used in place of the general's name. So like I said, Easy fix you can do, just do a search through your document for all uses of, of mom, dad, any military titles you have, sis, bro, uh, any, anything of that nature. And you can, um, you can search those up and make sure that one, they're consistent, and two, that they actually, actually follow the rules that you have. Now, that concludes the, uh, the five parts I have of the article series on how to clean up your manuscript for your editor, but I do have one bonus here. So the bonus is, if people, do people know the difference between British English versus American English? Now, these are not all of the differences, but these are the main ones. Now, of course, you're going to have different idiomatic sayings, different expressions, things like that, different words that are a part of British English rather than American. But in general, if you want to make sure that your book is written in American English and you're not making these mistakes, or if you're trying to write it in British English, these are some of the main things you can look at. So everyone knows about the O-R-U and, or sorry, O-U-R endings rather than O-Rs and color, or armor, or things of that nature. Uh, same with words such as gray, G-R-E-Y rather than G-R-A-Y. The, the interesting part gets into uh, the second one I have here, S-E-D endings rather than Z-E-D. A uh, good example of that word would be realized. In British, you'd spell it R-E-A-L-I-S-E-D. And in American, you'd spell it R-E-A-L-I-Z-E-D. So that's another, that's, 
main one you can do if you're trying to convert your book to one or the other you can do a search for, through your book for SED endings or ZED endings and just make sure that it's consistent with the, with the rules of the language being SED for British and ZED for American. Now, another one that people, people mess up frequently and don't realize that there is a specific difference here is toward and toward, rather towards and toward. The first one there, towards, and then uh, if you were to say forwards as well, both of those are British uses. If you're writing a book in American English, you will not use them with the S on the end. That's uh, something you can do a search through your document. Even if you're not worried about writing it in British English, just do a search through now. Make sure that you don't have those with the S on the ending because those aren't correct for American English. And the same would be the opposite. If you're trying to convert it to British English, then you can write it with the S on the end and make sure that every use is the same with those. The other one here would be the LED versus double LED endings. Uh, a good example of that word would be travel. If you're writing that in American English, then you'd have T-R-A-V-E-L-E-D. If you're writing this in British English, however, you'd have T-R-A-V-E-L-L-E-D. So that's another, another major one. Generally in British English, if you have an LED ending, it's gonna be a double L. There are specific words in American English that do have the double L as well, but if you're trying to write it in British English, then make sure that all of your endings are double L in order to stay consistent with the rules of the language. Now, that concludes what I have here for this talk. I, like I said at the beginning, I really appreciate Autry and the Right Services allowing me to host this for you. Um, this is the first talk of this nature that I've given before, uh, just on a recorded, recorded talk before. So hopefully everyone found it useful. Hopefully uh, people can start going through their manuscripts and cleaning it up for their editors so that you really build that good relation, relationship there. Again, if your editor really likes you and you really like your editor, it's going to be a much better arrangement. You're going to produce a much better product than if it's just a strictly business transaction. Um, so people are interested, I do have articles on my site which are, which are uh, helpful in nature for authors. I have a, a series on marketing which is linked from another author on my site. I do have a link to uh, my article series on how to prep your manuscript for editing hosted by Hydra Publications. And I have a couple other articles written by a few clients of mine. So if you're interested, you can check them out on my site on www.jdbookservices.com. Also, if you personally have written any articles that you think would be helpful for other authors to see, then definitely uh, use the contact form on my website. Shoot me an email and let me know. I'd, I'd love to get your book or get your, um, get your article rather hosted up there. Um, if you'd like also, you can look me up on Twitter at, at JD Book Services, Facebook at forward slash JD Book Services, and Instagram at JD Book underscore services, because yes, someone stole JD Book Services on Instagram. I'm trying to track down who that person is. If you find them, let me know, because I'd love to have a talk with them. Well, like I said, that concludes everything I have. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to all of this. And if you have any questions, I'm sure you can contact uh, Audrey and the Right Services, or I'd love to hear from you as well. And again, you can use the contact form on my site. I am really looking forward to doing the live Q&A session. I believe that's uh, July 20th. And I, I hope to hear from all of you then, hear whatever questions you might have. Take care.